Hello and good morning. Um, this is Matt from Google, and I'm got it from Shipstead. My manager told told us to um, introduce us with companies, so I'm doing that for him. Um, uh, we are here to talk about Spinnaker and um, how Spinnaker can help you deliver your applications to your runtime environment in a very nice way. Um, has anyone here heard about Spinnaker before going here? Wow, that's a lot of hands. Has anyone tested it? Very good. Um, feel free to ask us questions while we uh, present, and we'll do our best to respond to them. So uh, I'm jumping straight into a pipeline uh, screenshot. This is an actual pipeline that we're running uh, um, in our company. And this is kind of a typical, simple pipeline in Spinnaker. Um, all the circles you see here are um, stages uh, in the pipeline. And uh, um, the fields you see listed down here on the left side is, is tasks within a stage. Um, a typical pipeline has a trigger. Most of the pipelines we use have a CI trigger. That means that the pipeline is started based on a finished build, a successful build in the CI system. Currently, uh, Jenkins and Travis is supported in Spinnaker. Um, the CI build produces a Debian artifact or a RPM artifact, which is then picked up uh, from the CI system with the concrete version of the Debian artifact or the RPM artifact that is being uploaded uh, in the, from the CI build, and then the bakery in Spinnaker uses that concrete version and installs that to your image or container that you want to run in your runtime environment. So once the bake has finished, the deployable artifact is, is the uh, image reference to either your container or your image for your runtime environment. Then we deploy this um, image to the dev environment. And this, this is done in several ways. You can select various strategies. Uh, Matt will come back to how, what kind of strategies we have for this. But in this case, we are using re the red-black strategy, which is actually the same thing as blue-green, just different colors. Uh, when the deployment is done, and the, the dev environment is healthy, we go over to the verification stage to verify that the deployed artifact is ready to run in production. In this pipeline, we have a manual judgment stage. That means that the developer or uh, the tester or whoever needs to test it before it can go to production needs to sign off on, uh, uh, in Spinnaker to say that this is ready for production. This can be automated by using integration tests or performance tests or a combination of all of that. Um, Spinnaker has integrations to various uh, authorization providers, authentication providers, uh, and, uh, and your name is put into the judgment stage so you can always see who approved this for production, which is nice when you have a production issue. Uh, then, after the verification stage is successful, we start deploying to production. Um, a production deployment is just the same thing as, uh, as a dev development uh, deployment, a test environment deployment, um, but it's targeting a different cluster or account or whatever you use to defer production. Um, the next stage we have here is a Datadog event, and that's something custom to our organization. But we are using a generic stage in Spinnaker, which is the webhook stage. So there's actually a generic REST call to, uh, to whatever endpoint you want it to target. And we have a service that takes up the deployment events and stores them in Datadog as events for that application. This makes it possible for us to, like when we were looking at Datadog graphs, we see when the application was deployed, and we can correlate like instance and uh, changes in graphs to actual um, deployments. 
So it's convenient and makes it very flexible. So let's backtrack this a little bit. Uh, so what does Spinnaker mean? Spinnaker is a sail you put on a racing yacht to um, make the yacht go faster. You're still having the same exact yacht, but you just add the sail to it to make it go faster when running before the wind. And this is kind of the mindset within Spinnaker as well. So Spinnaker increases your uh, velocity when you're working with the cloud, and it does that by by um, embracing the features in your runtime environment. So Spinnaker doesn't run the smoke tests or do stuff like that. It relies on the provider's way of handling infrastructure and just gives you a um, common way of handling deployment strategies and cluster management on top of the provided APIs. So one example of this is uh, Kubernetes. So Kubernetes has its own way of declaring what the cluster is, what, uh, what, how to present the health or represent health, and load balancers. So uh, this is a Kubernetes replica set, which is, um, which is called a server group in Spinnaker. And this is a set of pods. And the health provider of pods is like Kubernetes has an interface to see if a pod is healthy. Usually you use liveness probes or redness probes to, to kind of see that it's healthy. And Spinnaker just uses the Kubernetes API and fetch this information from Kubernetes itself. And this is what you see on the right side here. Provider up, this is that the pod itself is healthy. On the top right corner, you have this load balancer icon and 100% uh, healthy. And this is service objects in Kubernetes is translated to load balancer in Spinnaker. And Spinnaker uses the status of your service object to resolve if the instance is receiving load or not. So as you can see, we're building on top of the Kubernetes features in order to control deployments and health status of your cluster. So, this, this next example is uh, from AVS. It's an ELB, uh, uh, an auto-scaling group, which has an ELB attached to it, or it, the auto-scaling group is attached to an ELB. So on the right side, you see that uh, the health is being set by its, its, the application being healthy in the load balancer, because the load balancers in AVS has a health check. So the feature of checking that an instance is up is within um, AVS, and Spinnaker just leverages this. So this, the same kind of strategies can be applied to the AVS clusters, which are, um, which are controlled by like deployment strategies, just using the health provider from the ELB instead of the, the service object in Kubernetes. So it's the same experience. The third kind of um, health check or status uh, thing in Spinnaker is the service uh, registries like Eureka, like Consul. Uh, Spinnaker integrates against those as well, so you can have Eureka as your health provider. And it does the same thing, but Eureka is not tied to the cloud provider itself. It's a separate provider for representing the health and controlling the the load of your application, if it should be consuming a queue or uh, be in load or whatever. So Spinnaker does the exact si same thing here and, and uses the API of Eureka or Console to resolve the health status. So Spinnaker doesn't run the smoke test itself. It re relies on the underlying infrastructure to do that for, for Spinnaker, on the behalf of Spinnaker. Yeah. So now Matt will take you through a little bit more details about the, how this works. All right. Thanks, Card. <clears throat> I've lost my voice a bit. I'm not going to yell. And uh, hopefully you can hear me OK. So Gard mentioned deployment strategies. So let's take a look at a few common deployment strategies. We'll go into a fair bit of detail, kind of the pros and cons of each. Um, 
the goal here is not to say that these are the only deployment strategies or to recommend using one over the other, just to give a sort of overview that it's flexible, you can create custom strategies, you can use built-in strategies, and to make the point of how these strategies leverage the underlying uh, cloud provider's native capabilities. So a pretty typical approach, Guard mentioned this, red-black deployment strategy. The idea here is you have one version of your software running in production, typically running in a server group containing some, some instances, some similar servers or VMs or containers. You want to roll out a new version, you would provision a second server group, same size as the original server group, but running the new version of the software. You wait for the underlying health providers, so this would be load balancers, discovery services, the platform, whatever's reporting health, to report that the newly provisioned infrastructure is healthy. Once it's healthy, you cut over all the traffic from the old server group to the new server group. At that point, once everything's healthy, once all the traffic has been cut over, you can stop sending requests to the old server group. It would end up in a disabled state, which roughly means um, not taking traffic from discovery services, so internal callers, load balancers, external callers, um, and if there are scaling policies and other things that are configured, those are typically disabled as well. The goal of this is to get the new version running, do it once the underlying systems report that it's healthy, but leave all the old infrastructure around so you can quickly roll back if something goes wrong. You don't want to have to reprovision everything in, in case of an issue. So that's a typical red-black. There's a more advanced version of this called a rolling red-black, which is quite similar. The primary difference is instead of cutting over all the traffic 100%, you do it in, in finer grained increments. So maybe a percentage-based approach or a time-based approach. So say first 5%, 10%, 25%, and so on. Uh, you would often gate these additional increments with some sort of verification or functional test. So roll over some of the traffic. Beside, besides the underlying providers reporting healthy, you can run tests against the new infrastructure. Once you're satisfied, turn the knob further, and it keeps going. And all this can happen uh, in an automated fashion. A benefit of doing the rolling red-black is that since you no longer have to provision a full-size server group with the new version of the software all at once to cut over everything 100%, you can be smarter in how you provision the new infrastructure. So maybe you do it several instances at a time. Maybe you start to destroy old instances but leave a certain number around. The, the main goal is to do it gradually gain confidence as you continue to cut traffic over, and maybe consider things like capacity management or costs. A third type, and this is really the, you know, at the more advanced end of the spectrum, would be a canary-based deployment strategy. Quite similar to the rolling red-black, the primary difference is that instead of a functional or verification test at each increment, or gating each in increment, you would run an automated canary analysis at each increment. And what this does typically is consider underlying metrics. So um, typical deployment, your infrastructure and your applications are recording metrics to some sort of backing telemetry store. Um, Prometheus, Datadog, Stackdriver, Atlas, there are many of these. And an automated canary analysis tool, which is in the works here and should be open source shortly, I'd hope, um, can consider these metrics. You can configure how you want them considered so you can give more weight to one or the other but in automated fashion can say this does or does not meet our requirements, taking into account underlying things like CPU utilization, memory utilization, latency, error rates, response codes, all those kinds of things, as well as business metrics, whatever custom metrics you define. Uh, it's quite generic, and it lets you at each step say, here's what a human would look at uh, if they had to do it manually, but we've gotten to the point where we can automate this, so let's use that to, to gate the increments as we do a progressive rollout. All right, next, so Guard mentioned pipelines, mentioned stages. Let's look in a little more detail. Um, the, the thing to keep in mind, the pipeline is the top-level construct that's available in Spinnaker to build your automation. Uh, it's composed of first-class stages. Um, that's what you see here. It's what you saw in Guard's earlier slide. Um, this is a pretty simple example, even though it's made up just for the slides. So something kicks off a pipeline. There are, are many ways to trigger this. It can be a cron job, it can be a CI job completing, um, another pipeline completing, you can programmatically kick it off, manually kick it off, a bunch of these things, right? Once a pipeline kicks off, you can have potentially multiple branches. In this case, there's one main branch and then several branches that, that join back together. But the first stage there is a find image. 
A lot of pipelines that you see in Spinnaker uh, make it very clear that the thing that you're testing and promoting is the image. It's not a jar file or a war file or a source code. It's an image. It's a baked artifact. So a VM image, a container image, some sort of deployable asset that won't change throughout the testing and promotion. So in this case, we're resolving an image. We decide to deploy it to a new environment with a red-black deployment strategy, which we'll dig into in more detail, do some tests, do some kind of waiting, scale down the old production, but don't destroy it yet, um, wait for some other additional approvals, wait some longer period of time, and then when we have a lot of confidence, we can eventually destroy the old infrastructure, since we're likely, uh, at this point, not going to have to roll back. One of the key strengths of Spinnakers at these stages look largely the same from the pipeline construction point of view, uh, regardless of what provider you're targeting. So if you're targeting AWS or Kubernetes or OpenStack, Cloud Foundry, Azure, GCE, App Engine, whatever, or Oracle Bare Metal Cloud, lots of integrations. Whatever underlying cloud you're targeting, these stages look mostly the same. The, the, the common concepts look the same across the clouds. When you get into the fine-grained details, it starts to look different. But the idea is it's, it's a common experience. Once you know how to do it for one, it works for all the others, and you can mix and match. So you often see pipelines that do a bunch of tests and then slowly fan out and start to push out the newly verified code to different clouds or, or you know, different clusters, that kind of thing. So looking at one stage. So the notion of deploying seems fairly straightforward. These stages look like atomic things, but, but in reality, they, they're composed of finer grain steps. So in the case of this deploy, with the red-black strategy configured, it breaks down to a bunch of steps. There's a deployment step, there's a shrink cluster step, disable, scale down, and we'll look at what each of these mean. But picking just one of those, disable cluster, even that decomposes further into a bunch of individual tasks. So the first one is determine health providers. This can be, do I have Eureka or console configured? Uh, am I just looking at the underlying platform health? Do I have load balancers configured? Uh, disable cluster, it, it essentially restricts the number of active server groups in that cluster to whatever you configured in your red-black configuration. And then there are various monitoring steps. And what that's doing is it's essentially saying, make sure the underlying cloud provider has done all the work it can at this point. So I can't get any other further information from that in-flight operation. It doesn't say that it completed successfully. It doesn't say anything about the resulting state. It just says, I did all the work I can. Next, we say update the cache. What makes all this responsive is that there are various agents running in the background to build um, graphs of the resources that you're managing with Spinnaker. So there's some tactical updates of that cache in the background. Then there's a thing that says, now wait until the desired state is achieved. So the earlier step just said, do all the work you can. Then it said, start to update everything so I can, I can have a responsive interface. And the final step says, OK, now wait until it achieves that desired state. If the desired state was to disable some set of infrastructure, the wait is saying, wait until all of the health providers say, yep, it's disabled. It's not taking traffic. It's not being served up as an endpoint for internal discovery services. It's not auto-scaling. Whatever the desired configuration is, this, this is what verifies that it was achieved. And the last step is, again, to update now that everything's been completed. If you look at disabled cluster, this actually decomposes further. Those are actual cloud platform operations. So forwarding rules, target pools, remove instance, each of these amount to several platform operations. So you can see looking at the top level pipeline where there's a step that looks, or stage that looks atomic, which is just deploy, do a red black, it ends up as many, many uh, low level tasks against the platform. And what we tried to achieve with this is that, it's not that you don't have to be familiar with the underlying platform, but you don't have to be hopefully an expert in every single nuance of every one of these low level operations. If you look at the APIs that the underlying cloud platforms provide, each API is simple enough, but when you get to the point of wanting to cobble them together and do something more complex, it does get difficult. And then reapplying that same work to a different platform is, is almost a, an exercise that starts from scratch. So we try to give like a common experience without requiring a, like a pure abstraction. It's just a common experience. The underlying details are different. All right. So um, assuming I'm still on the network, I'll reload it to make sure. OK, so we want to show you what it looks like running. We'll do a live demo. Um, one thing I wanted to point out before we get into it, the demo that we're doing here was 
configured and constructed and even really the script of what we're going to do is all taken from one of the code labs or tutorials that we have on the site. So the spinnaker.io site has a whole bunch of tutorials focused on a bunch of different platforms. This particular one takes a user from scratch through provisioning a full Spinnaker installation on a VM, including a local Jenkins instance, a local Git repo with a simple Hello World application, and then configure pipelines, kick it off, experiment with the results, and all of that. So I'm really following, without deviation, a, a publicly available tutorial on how to get started and, and try all of this out. Uh, as we get into it, I just want to kick off the Jenkins job. The job completes very quickly. It packages up a simple Java app uh, and publishes a, a dev package to a local um, Nginx-backed dev repo. I think it's aptly we're using, but it's all on that same VM. So I'm just going to run this because it takes a couple minutes once the pipeline kicks off um, to provision the new server group. So let's do a quick tour of the UI. Um, there's some terminology that'll, that'll need to sound kind of familiar as we get further into it. So the UI, um, after you play with it for a few minutes, you realize there are really two sides to it. There's the cloud management side, which is this clusters view, the load balancers view, security groups. It's, it shows you a rendering of the infrastructure you have under management and lets you perform a bunch of ad hoc operations. These can be clone operations, destroy, resize, delete, whatever. Um, terminate, you can isolate things for troubleshooting, create new things, but they're ad hoc operations. It happens in an interactive way. It's as you work with the user interface, those things happen for you. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that everything you see from the user interface, whether it's rendering things that pipelines are doing in the background or things that happen in response to us interacting with the user interface, this all happens via an API gateway. So 100% of what we're doing can be done the same way with the APIs. The UI is not doing any magic. So this is a clusters view. There are two clusters here. The top one is, um, it's just codelab-prod is the name of the cluster. The bottom one is codelab-test. These are arbitrary names. But the way to think about this is a cluster is a logical grouping of server groups. A server group is a logical grouping of instances. Um, above clusters, you have an application. This whole application is called CodeLab. Uh, the terminology is overloaded. It's probably not great terminology, but, but that's what we have. So um, don't read too much into the terms cluster or application. Just what an instance is depends on what platform you're targeting. In this case, I think I only have GCE configured. I'm so sorry, it's just the Google Cloud configured. The, um, the instances in this case happen to be virtual machines. If you're using Kubernetes, they would be um, pods. The server groups, again, are platform dependent. So if you're on Amazon, it's an auto-scaling group. If you're deploying to Kubernetes, it would be a replica set. For GCE, it's a managed instance group. It just depends on the underlying infrastructure. So poking around here, this cluster has two server groups. This cluster has two server groups. You see there are different version numbers here. So if we click on one of the server groups in the code lab test, bunch of details. It's the kind of stuff you'd expect, what network are the instances in the server group attached to some location information? You can kick off some individual operations in the context of this server group, and so on. There are a bunch of context-sensitive operations under a pull-down menu, um, even things like clone, where I want another one of the same, but maybe I want a different image. All this stuff is pretty good for tactical work, troubleshooting, experimenting, testing, that kind of thing. Okay, And these Server group wizards or modals look very, very similar from provider to provider. So in the same environment, if you have multiple providers configured, which, which many large customers do, um, they look about the same, but the details start to differ. And the details should look familiar to somebody uh, deploying infrastructure out to their platform. So those are server groups. If we click on one of these little green chiclets, probably not a great name either, you'll see some instance-specific details on the right and then some instance-specific options. And again, these are things for abandoning instances, terminating them, rebooting them, isolating them for troubleshooting. Maybe you don't want a particular instance to take traffic because it's acting up, but you don't want it destroyed, so it allows you to do those kinds of things. On some platforms, you can even shell directly into the instance, so it's, it's really good for you know, acting as a single like operational pane where you can tie additional systems into the UI. So quickly, before we get to the pipelines, there are a couple of other bits that we have to look at so the pipelines make sense. 
Think of the server groups and clusters as more ephemeral things. You're always destroying server groups and instances and creating new ones. Things like load balancers and security groups are a little more durable. So load balancers, we know what those are. Security groups are more like firewall rules, ingress rules, egress rules, port ranges. It's all of the things that you know, allow you to poke holes in and out of your infrastructure. So security groups, hopefully you're not creating and destroying tons of those. Load balancers, put them in the same boat. It's more durable infrastructure. But to do anything meaningful, you will have some set of these things existing in your environment. For the purposes of the demo, we have some security groups which are kind of irrelevant, but the load balancers are quite relevant. So we have two load balancers. We have a test one and a prod one. The names in this case are, are arbitrary. It's just so we can see what's being attached. Don't read too much into the names. But you can see as you dig in here, each load balancer has a server group listed under it. The bottom one has one, the top one has two. Again, it can show the instances, so you can always drill down to the details. But where it gets very interesting is under the pipeline view. So let's go over there. I think the terminology should all be familiar now. We'll look at the overall setup. We'll look at the configuration. We'll look at what's, what's kicked off so far. And I think we have, we're, we're really good on time, so I don't think we need to go too fast. So this is a fairly typical workflow for a, a set of continuous delivery pipelines. We have three pipelines configured here, and it turns out there's an execution of, of one under each, but we'll come back to that. So we have three pipelines configured. The top one is a bake and deploy to test, and we'll look at the configuration in a second. But the idea here is that we went, we poked the job on the Jenkins server, it built some simple Java Hello World app, it published it to a local dev repo, and then this pipeline kicked off. And the way that works is that Jenkins has a, a simple webhook-based integration or a polling integration with Spinnaker, and Spinnaker notices that that job that this pipeline is configured to care about Completed successfully, it kicks off the pipeline. The important detail there is that the pipeline, when it was kicked off, was primed with information from that Jenkins job. So it knows what artifacts were produced, it knows the build number, the address of the job. There's a bit of uh, build in for provenance that, that extends throughout the pipeline. So you can always get back to from this server group, it was this build, it was this pipeline, it's this artifact. That's all linked throughout the UI. So that first pipeline kicks off. It takes that dev package, which is in a repo somewhere, in this case locally, and then it wants to produce a machine image. The idea with the bake stage is that that machine image is the immutable thing that we're testing. Throughout all of this, we adopt this principle of immutable infrastructure. You test things, you don't change them. If you, wanted, if you get in a spot where it feels like you need to change something, the right approach is really to tear it down, fix it, and rebuild it. Capture that, test that thing, don't change it again. As you gain increasing confidence in your test pass, then you start to promote it through the additional environments. So that bake and deploy to test, takes a dev package, bakes a machine image, deploys it into a test environment. That's its only responsibilities. This is a VM-oriented demo. If this were a container-oriented demo, the only difference would be instead of a bake stage, you would likely use another hosted service to produce the container image, and then the pipeline just triggers off of that container image. So instead of noticing that a dev package showed up and the pipeline being responsible for baking it into a machine image, you notice that a container image showed up, and you go right into the deploy. That's the only distinction. Okay. Following that, there's a validation pipeline, which is triggered off of the earlier pipeline completing. And we'll look at that in a second. And once that's done, there's a promotion pipeline. So let's look at the configuration of each of these, and then we'll, we'll respond to that manual judgment. So this is the bake and deploy to test pipeline. It's a fairly straightforward pipeline. It's just one sequential set of stages. There are no branches in this one. But if we look at the configuration, we say we want to trigger off of a Jenkins job completing. There are a bunch of different types of triggers, as we mentioned. In this case, it's Jenkins. It's interacting with Jenkins. It gives you pull-down lists to select from the jobs and so on. We say we want this hello build job as the, the artifact we care about. When that job completes, produces an artifact, the pipeline is primed with it, and we can use it downstream. So downstream, we have a bake stage. This looks fairly similar from platform to platform. It says, well, there's some package, and it does a bit of decorating of this package to try to find the correct version that was produced by the upstream CI job. So what this means is that if you have a bunch of Jenkins or Travis jobs that are producing different artifacts, when you run a pipeline from one of those jobs, it'll install the correct version of the package. So it doesn't just take the latest or try to install the package with that name with no version. It looks in the contextual information primed into the pipeline from the Jenkins job to find the exact version. So you can always go to an earlier version or a later version. Um, 
base operating systems, you can configure base images. So all of this is dynamically put together from the back end. If you have different base images that you're curating for your environment, they can be, they can be chosen here. But this, is, this particular stage is a good example of how um, stages look basically the same from provider to provider, but the, the fine-grained details start to differ a little bit. So in this case, there are slightly different options for a GCE-oriented bake versus an AWS-oriented bake. But most of the time, you can stick to the, the paved road and the common attributes, and things work fine. So we have a bake, and assuming that completes successfully, we have a deploy. We looked a moment ago, I clicked on the clone operation for a given server group, and we saw a server group wizard. Well, when I click on edit for deploy, I see the exact same server group wizard. And this is a key feature of Spinnaker in that the, the building blocks, the stages that you have to put together your automation are the same exact building blocks you can interact with from the APIs or with the, the cloud management side of the user interface. So ad hoc and you know, background automated tasks are the same tasks. There's no difference. The single only distinction in the UI is that in the other one, there was an image field, a pull down that said, these are the images we've queried from the back end. When you do it in a pipeline, there's no image field here. It's getting it from the context of the pipeline. The image that you want to provision onto that new infrastructure is what was primed into the context of the pipeline from the Jenkins job that triggered the pipeline. You can override it. There are expressions and all kinds of things. But this is a typical approach, is that use what's in context. OK, so we have a deploy. Oh, there's one other thing here. So, uh, for strategy, we chose none. We didn't choose a deployment strategy. We will in the other pipeline. For this one, we'll leave it at none. It makes the pipeline simpler. It's easier to see what happened in the end. So we have deploy, and then we have destroy. There are a lot of stages that look almost exactly like destroy. There's destroy, disable, enable, resize, that all have this similar notion of targeting coordinates. So if you see here, it says choose an account. So an account matches to like a set of credentials on a back-end provider. So it could be an AWS account, Google account, could be multiples of each of these. The targeting coordinates are the account, the region, the cluster. So where do you want to look for this thing you want to take some action on? And then the actual coordinates. So do I want to look at the newest one, the oldest one, the second and the most recent one, largest one? It's those kinds of things. So the idea is you don't want to give a name for a server group. It's going to change. You'd have to change your captured pipeline config um, from run to run. So you just say, well, in this case, I'm deploying the new version of my software into a test environment. I don't care about the old version. So just destroy the previous server group. And that's what it'll do. When this pipeline runs all the way through, we get a new server group with a new version. It destroys the old one. We don't need to keep it around. We're not going to roll back to it. That's it for this pipeline. So this pipeline ran. There was a bake. It was triggered off of the Jenkins job, which is linked. This build link here is the Jenkins job that we kicked off. Then we have the bake stage, which produces a machine image. And there's the various details of it. It says what package was installed, all the configuration. You can even get to the underlying bake logs. Um, the bakery delegates to Packer in a typical approach. But this is it's pretty extensible. You can do different things. But it's, it links directly to the logs. There's an image produced, which is then available in the pipeline context. And that's what we deploy. And here's where we're actually provisioning something new. And it says it provisioned this new code lab test version 5 server group. So if we look at the cloud management view or the clusters tab, there is in test a new server group. And you can see from the time this happened while we were in here, but the other server group is gone. It destroyed it. And we can see that from the output of the pipeline. I know I'm jumping around. So it destroyed version four of the server group. I hope that's is that legible. You guys can see that? Yeah. All right. So we destroyed four. So that's gone. We don't need to roll back to it. But if we look at this next pipeline, in the configuration, instead of choosing a Jenkins job, we said we want to trigger from a pipeline. So we've pipeline. We chose which pipeline. Sorry, that's the application. We chose which pipeline we wanted to trigger off of. It's bake and deploy to test. We only want this to trigger when it's successful. And in this case, that pipeline completed OK. And this is, you know, it's an example, right? It just says do some verification. In this case, it prompts a user validate that test cluster because we don't want to continue on unless we're happy with what was provisioned. So. This is waiting for us to do something. Um, there are a bunch of different notification styles. It can email, Slack, SMS, there's a Twilio. There's a bunch of different integrations. But in this case, we'll just say, yep, continue. It'll take a few seconds to notice. And what's going to happen after that, there's a third pipeline. And this is really the end of the, the workflow. Again, triggered from a pipeline. In this case, triggered from the validation pipeline. 
Again, only if it's successful. Now this is a little bit different, so we're not going to bake a new image. We said throughout, we want the image to be immutable. Um, we're not going to change it, so we want to refer to that existing image, the one we already tested in the test cluster, and promote it into the prod cluster. So the way we do that is instead of looking at the Jenkins job and finding a dev package and producing a machine image, we use that same set of targeting coordinates to say, well, look in the test cluster and find the newest server group and resolve the image from that. So that's what find image from cluster does. And at this point, in the pipeline context, instead of an image that resulted from a bake, we have an image that resulted from this find image job. And then again, we have a deploy. It looks quite similar. There are two differences. We're deploying to the prod cluster instead of the test cluster. And we configured a deployment strategy, in this case, red black. And there's an additional detail here, which we didn't touch on yet. There's an option where you can say maximum number of server groups to leave. And the, the reason we have this is that, well, if you start from scratch and you have zero server groups and you do a red-black deployment, you're just going to end up with one server group that's active. And if you do another red-black to the same cluster, you're still going to end up with one server group that's active, and you're going to have one that's disabled or inactive. And then if you do it again, you're going to end up with one that's active and two that are, that are inactive. So this just bounds it to say, leave at most two server groups, no matter their status, whether they're enabled or disabled. So we say just leave two, and this way it'll start to tear down the, the very old server groups. So we click that manual judgment. Now the final pipeline's running. So it shows the find image status. It resolved the same image that was produced by the earlier bake, but it resolved it from the running cluster. And then it starts to run the deploy. And if we look here, you end up, it's deploying into prod version 5. So we go look there, and it's deploying this one, and it'll take a while. So it's going to deploy that one. It's going to provision the server group. We set everything to one instance because it's simpler and faster. So we'll have that one instance. It's going to wait for it to be healthy. Now it's green, which means it determined it's healthy. It's going to start to disable the old server groups, and then it's going to wait for them to show as being not healthy by the underlying health providers. Then it'll start to destroy those. And then it'll wait for them to be destroyed. So that pipeline isn't going to complete until all of that work happens. And in the end, it's probably 15 or 20 underlying steps and probably 40 to 50 straight up API calls against the underlying cloud platform, not counting the queries for health that are being done in the background by caching agents. So it's a lot of work to get things to that point. And the, the idea with the deployment strategies is make it repeatable and give a disciplined way to compose your deployment strategy so you don't have to figure all this out from scratch each time. Um, two things worth mentioning about the deployment strategies. First, uh, we showed a list of some choices there, but there's a nice thing here, which doesn't get used that much, probably because we don't show it that much, but there's an option here somewhere for custom. So I don't have any custom strategies defined here. But what a custom strategy is, you come to the same pipeline editor, and instead of creating a pipeline, you create a strategy. So you can cobble together or wire together whatever steps make sense for your style deployment strategy, save it with a name, and then other users in your application can choose that as their deployment strategy. Because you can very easily wire together a red-black using top-level stages or something slightly different. Maybe you have a red-black with a verification step. So custom strategies allow you to do that. The other thing worth mentioning is managed pipeline templates, which Guard may touch on a bit. If not, when we get to the end, if we have a couple minutes, we'll touch on it. But it allows you to share underlying pipeline configurations among groups, have like a curated library of templates, so that when you settle on a configuration that you like and that you think other groups should use, you can share it and they don't have to start from scratch, and you can parameterize it and make it extensible and all of that. And all of that uh, is in, in service of this idea of like a disciplined, repeatable approach to composing these stages into pipelines. So last step before I turn it back over to guard, it's still running. But just to give you an idea, each of these stages decomposes into many steps. Each of these is a quite a collection of steps, and it's going to keep going. It's probably maybe another minute before it completes. But I think I can turn it back over to guard while that runs in the background. Is this working? Is it? Yep. Yeah. OK. Um, so now you've been looking at uh, Matt's great uh, demonstration. And you're probably wondering, how can I test this? How can I test this? How can I test this? And you can actually test it quite easily, um, at least in uh, Google, ABS, Azure, and Kubernetes. There are quick start guides on uh, spinnaker.io 
which gets you started very quickly to start it. Uh, if you decide to move on and use Spinnaker for your um, for your organization and you want to have a like stable, good setup, you should use the new cool cool tool called uh, Halyard, which is which is a configuration service for Spinnaker. So Halyard is a service that you run on the machine, and you have a CLI to interact with this service. And what it does is that when you configure a cloud provider, like a Kubernetes provider, uh, you have a lot of fields like the, the authorization against the Kubernetes cluster, the endpoints you reach, what the Docker registries to use, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of configuration, and it's different for every cloud provider because it's cloud provider specific information. But Halyard validates the, the configuration you supply and actually tests the configuration against uh, the cloud providers to see that it's valid and gives you feedback. If, you've, if you are missing fields or it can't speak to your cluster or, or whatever reason, uh, it, can't, it doesn't work, it will give you an uh, error message and try to guide you in the right direction of solving this. So it really helps you do this. And at the same time, it helps you maintain your Spinnaker app, app, uh, installation. So it, uh, if you're upgrading Spinnaker and new configuration flags are appearing, it will help you migrate to the newest version. Uh, and in uh, Spinnaker, there are like 10 services. And Halyard makes it easy to use endorsed version releases of this uh, bunch of services. So it makes it convenient for users to keep a cr cluster running, make it stable, and also upgrade it to the latest version, stable endorsed versions. So uh, if you're going to use Spinnaker in the organization for real after testing it, definitely check out Halyard. Uh, for all kinds of questions and uh, stuff like that, we we are on uh, Slack and uh, and uh, Spinnaker.io has a lot of documentation now, and uh, it, sh it should be uh, possible to look up on Spinnaker.io and see how to solve your problem. So, when you have set up uh, Spinnaker installation and you want to um, to maintain it, it's probably good to have some kind of monitoring. So there's been put in a lot of effort into making uh, Spinnaker easy to operate. And uh, one key part of this is getting metrics from the, the Spinnaker cluster. And uh, Spinnaker has a Spinnaker monitoring part, with, which is a kind of sidecar that you run along the services, which provides um, metrics that are uh, consumable by Prometheus. It's able to push to Datadog. And I'm not sure if it's push or pull to Stackdriver, but it supports Stackdrivers as well. Yeah, so, it's both modes. Yeah. So, uh, so all the, the metrics um, systems, the major metric systems, are supported. And in those repositories on GitHub, there is uh, pre-made dashboards for uh, Stackdriver, Datadog, Prometheus, that you can just upload to your uh, account and see see a lot of details about your Spinnaker uh, installation. And the cool part, which surprised me a lot, was uh, how uh, I learned a lot from it, because Spinnaker provides multi-dimensional metrics, and you're actually able to look up uh, uh, all all your uh, Spinnaker uh, services and look at metrics and then filter it by application. So you can see um, applications that the users have and what kind of impact they have on your Spinnaker installation. So you can see the kind of footprint of every application that is managed by Spinnaker, which is really cool. So, um, a little bit about how to get started with Spinnaker. Uh, the first place to look is Spinnaker.io, where all the documentation is. And um, if you have, uh, if you want, you can look at the Spinnaker repositories on GitHub. You're all developers, so uh, I think um, looking at the source is a great way of learning stuff. Um, 
we have a Slack channel, or a Slack um, space, yeah, a Slack group. Uh, at least if you go to join.spinnaker.io, you can join us on Slack. Uh, there's currently 3,300 users on that Slack uh, group, so it's, um, it's a really active and channels for Halyard, channels for Kubernetes, channels for all, all kinds of stuff. So if you need help, it's possible to get it on, on Slack. Um, um, on um, Stack Overflow, there's a tag spinnaker, which is being, uh, being read regularly of, uh, from the developers and everyone to, to respond to questions on Stack Overflow. Um, spinnaker was open sourced in November 2015. Uh, there is 1,900 forks of the repositories, uh, 4,500 stars, and there is 251 users that has contributed uh, with the PRs, different users. Uh, one of these users were Ubuntu, so I think Ubuntu is not the real user, so it's 250 contributors. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> we have made a video that shows uh, this activity from uh, when Spinnaker uh, started until now, which is. So here you see the activity in Spinnaker, like pre-open sourcing it, and now it's open sourced. And you see how, how the project grows and the amount of users that are contributing. So it's quite cool to see the activity. Now we're in 26th, and uh, yeah, it goes fast. So yeah, there's a lot of activity in this project. New repositories and services are coming, and new cloud providers, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of traction in the project, and it just keeps on getting better. Um, in our company, we started back in 20, actually in November 2015. Um, and in the beginning, like the first year, we did a lot of pull requests and stuff to fix kind of edges that we met in Spinnaker. Right now, we are not facing a lot of edges anymore. Uh, we are becoming more and more of uh, consumers of Spinnaker, which is great uh, because that shows that Spinnaker is getting mature and, and uh, really solves all our problems. What's happened here? Did I close the presentation? Yeah, I think just go up to view again, yeah. Yep. Little bit, uh... Yeah. So this is the roadmap, so this is basically showing that a lot of stuff is happening in Spinnaker. Um, there, are, there are some highlighted items here, uh, which is uh, like in 2016, the Kubernetes provider was created. And Kubernetes works kind of different from the, the uh, AVS cloud, uh, GCE, and all the regular clouds, because Kubernetes has its own kind of concepts. There was a little bit of feedback on this. So, uh, so the, the terminology and the way we interact with the Kubernetes cluster didn't really fit that well with Kubernetes. So in a response to that, uh, it got prioritized to create the Kubernetes provider version 2, which is not based on, um, on the same kind of concepts uh, as before. Now it's uh, template-oriented. So you, you upload the Kubernetes manifests to Kubernetes instead of having all kinds of abstractions on top of that. Uh, I see that we have two minutes left, so uh, um, there are a lot of things to say, so I'll try to be quick. Um, pipelines as code, as Matt mentioned, is, is uh, uh, getting mature, more and more mature now. You can handle your pipelines as code, share templates, inherit from templates, and it's uh, really neat. And you can create templates or pipelines in the UI and dump them to pipelines as code. So you don't need to do it all from code in the beginning, and you can experiment and then download the template from Spinnaker, which makes it a lot easier to iterate on the pipelines. Um, yeah, I think I'll just skip this. Um, there is there is a lot of stickers here. We got that from someone <laughs> uh, uh, right in front of the talk. So you can pick up Spinnaker stickers and will be around after the talk in uh, 
the areas around here, and you can just grab us and talk with us if you have anything you want to talk about. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for having us yeah, and listening. Nice job.